Thank you for downloading, subscribing, and telling your friends about the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Coming to you from the kitchen studios in downtown Raleigh. This episode is sponsored in part by Spot On, tech that helps your business grow. Request a demo at spoton.com. And GigPro. Change the way you find staff with GigPro. And Joe Van Gogh Coffee, serving the community from seed to cup. And now, judging you and your work ethic while they slothfully sip their bourgeois coffee from their lofty fourth floor perch. It's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today, this feels like the return of the recluse. Uh, It's You're back. I am back. (laughs) And that voice is Chef Shane Ingram, uh, who's lauded for many yeah. wonderful establishments, uh, your own restaurant, the Foursquare, you've been the chef at the Farrington House, and uh, and now you and your partner partner here, Miss Kelsey Lego, are uh, helming the new kitchen at the Durham Hotel. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, bringing us on, and uh, nice to be here. And yep, we're we're at the Durham. Yeah, thank you for reemerging. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Shane Ingram, the cicada of the culinary world. <laughs> That's right. Right? So um, <laughs> when I first moved here 2013, I was aware of Shane Ingram uh, because, uh, I was mentioned before, uh, Scott James my, was my chef over at Midtown Grill. Scott knew everybody, and he was my connection to, to meeting all the chefs in town and was really great. And I just – there was such high praise coming from – it's like, oh, yeah, you know – Chef Ingram, he's killing it right now. He was at Foursquare. You've done, I mean, everyone knows like restaurants like One, it's the now shuttered One and uh, G2B, but these two restaurants, you opened these restaurants, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to which then uh, former guest of the show, Chef Kim Floresca, uh, she took over the, the helm at some point, I believe, and and was running that restaurant. But you've been around arguably like the most notable restaurants in the triangle for for years running your own programs uh just uh, you know a, a, a crazy entity you're kind of like the chef's chef but as we even did in a pre-interview here you're like i don't get out too much i don't uh, do a lot of this you seem like a quiet guy you seem like you kind of keep to yourself but once you get into that kitchen it's game on yeah. is that a fair assessment yeah fair um I've always been working, um, always been working and um, running my own restaurant or running the kitchen at uh, Farrington. So it doesn't allow me to to get out much and experiment around town or do much um, research and development. <laughs> yeah, but maybe that's also. I mean, there are a lot of chefs that bust their butt in the kitchen, but they also like to like get out there and be you know social butterflies as well. So I, I think that's also. Maybe a decision that you make too. Is like, uh, yeah, I'm a little favorite. bit older at this point in time now too. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> getting out is a little bit harder for me than it was perhaps when I was in my twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go back there to your twenties, and uh, you you've worked for some of the best chefs, the most notable chefs in the country, like Emeril Lagasse and uh, Charlie Trotter. And Max has some questions loaded about Charlie, so get ready. Oh, I'm ready. Okay. He was one of my favorite people. Awesome. Um, but before we'll tell. <clears throat> There's a story about Emerald that uh, I think you were like camped out outside of Emeralds to trying to get a job or yeah, that's a true story. Um, I was coming from the hotels in Atlantic City where I grew up. Oh, and um, I was it was time to leave New Jersey and I wanted to go to a real culinary city and I chose New Orleans and I was actually interviewing in the hotels down there. And it was some uh, hotel chef, a, a guy I never met or I met him, but I, I don't remember his name. Uh, he, he said, Shane, let me get this straight. You came down to New Orleans. You don't have a job. And I'm like, nope. He's like, you don't have a place to live. And I'm like, nope. And he's like, go see Emerald. <laughs> and that's how it started. That's how uh, my career started. I went and talked to Emerald, and Emerald would say, you know, come back next week. You know, come back in two days. Come back. And I eventually ran out of money. And I was like, Emerald, you, you got to hire me or not. Yeah. And, and he did. And so that went on for weeks until you got a job there. Probably a couple weeks, yeah. 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 And did you, did, so like, where were you sleeping at the time? Well, you, you know, a hotel. You, 
you just uh, scrounge enough money left. And, yeah, you yeah. know, everything I own fit in the back of my car, so uh, it probably wasn't that hard. But I did run out of money. That w- that's a true story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you have to leave New Jersey for uh, nefarious reasons, or N- no? In Atlantic City, you had the hotels, but there wasn't too much else going on in the culinary scene. So, yeah. um, I did want to. It was just an adventure, I guess, that I wanted to take and to, to go to a, a bigger city. So Emerald finally hires you. Yeah. And uh, what was your first job there? Well, <laughs> he put me in the Garmage. Okay. And um, I worked in the Garmage for a while. I wasn't totally happy with it. I remember one time telling him, you know, and he basically took me outside and said, shut up and keep you know, put your head down yeah. and get to work. And so I did. And um, after that, we were great friends. Nice. Yeah. And did you eventually work your way up through Emerald's Kitchen? Oh, sure, yeah. He had that open kitchen, so he had he was a star even back then. He, and the celebrities would always come in, and so he had like what he called the food bar, and we would cook for anybody who wanted to sit in front of the food bar. And you know, he introduced me to uh, uh, what I s- still used at Foursquare, anyways. The, the his rules for success a successful restaurant: name recognition, eye contact gang service and that's uh, really what we brought to foursquare gang service meaning like when you drop the plates everyone drops it at the same time yeah that's right yeah, yeah. that's right man i remember i remember things like that we were actually just talking about the way we used to set up restaurants back in the day with the string you know you'd you'd be on one end i'd be on the other end you hold the string down on the table so that all of the forks and knives mm-hmm. touched the string perfectly and then you know the glassware is just like so precise everything's so specific all the tables have been ironed with you know you get like the uh the long corded iron but most if you were really cool you had a battery operated iron so you're like walking around and ironing all the tabletops it's like cool but holy crap man that's a lot of work yeah. can i say all those three things that you mentioned first are to me personally are wildly more important the eye contact the recognition the understanding of of service because i was at a dinner recently and i won't name names but and it was great but they were trying to do the gang service and you could just tell that they weren't coordinated like yeah. they would they would look at each other and they are we going and then and then they would drop a plate and still have to walk around you it's like no you can just you can just drop two at the time. Like that's why you stand in the well, middle. Well, ballet two. services the yeah. way I always heard, but but you don't do it the way you're saying left and right by putting it in there. You you always serve from the same hand. Well, if but, every right, if everyone's you're coordinated. supposed to look and you look across the table at your server service partner and you kind of give a quick like okay uh, I'm, eye moment and it's like mm-hmm, and then we all go down together and then we all take a step to the left and then you do it again and you do that until all the tables have been seated and it should be done right yeah but yeah but then you see like people that don't know how to do it that think they know how to do it and they're like uh-huh and then they do it and then they both walk the same direction and bump into each other right or something yeah it's it needs to be rehearsed yeah. folks otherwise yeah. just Simply put my plate down in front of me. Don't don't elbow. Don't backhand me, and uh, and we'll be good. Yeah, it's fun. Make when sure it my works. fork and knife are there. You know. Yeah, that's the most important. It's like it's fun when it works, but just let's get the fundamentals down first. Yeah, let's make sure that the the napkins are all polished, or you know, the napkins are clean and the silverware's polished, and then we'll start worrying about the next step. But um, but so I, Matt did mention the the Charlie Trotter thing. So for those that don't know about you know Charlie Trotter, uh, Chicago. Mm-hmm kind of the definition of fine dining food coming out of Chicago. Uh, He's notorious in the industry, right? Uh, Notable for being kind of an aggressive person in the kitchen and yeah. and having some I, we were just i was mentioning before we got on here that for grace the curtis duffy podcast if you haven't or not podcast but documentary if you haven't watched it watch this if you like food and you like you know to know about fine dining or so it's a tremendous documentary about a tremendous chef curtis duffy but uh, he has moments where he talks about formerly working for charlie trotter if anything can you just Paint us the tableau of what it would be like to walk into Trotter's Kitchen and the environment of uh, a day in a life in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, the day started early. Um, basically, as soon as we got up, we would just go ahead and go into work. And um, he had a lot of people in the kitchen, so that part was nice. Um, he was doing his own food then. You know, It wasn't similar to anything that I've ever seen in my life. 
And um, there wasn't a lot of talking, and it wasn't because you couldn't talk. It was just because we were all so busy. You, you got there, and you put your coat on, and you started working, and you didn't stop until you finished. Um, his restaurant was always busy, so um, you were always up against the clock, and there was a lot of pressure. And, and it wasn't just Charlie that was great. It was all his cooks, too, and all of us were competing against each other, I think, to earn his favor and mm-hmm. to try to advance in his kitchen. And so it was like working with 12 Charlie Trotters, I think, <laughs> at, at times. <laughs> and um, I, I do want to say I love the man. I, I thought it was great. He would, on occasion, take us into the dining room and talk to us, and I, it was great just to listen to him. He was that, that kind of a person, uh, one, in a, one in a million. And um, he was a bit of a taskmaster. Um, we, we'd finish the night, it'd be midnight, and we'd be cleaning up the kitchen or scrubbing behind an oven, and he'd get behind you and say, you missed a spot. Like, really, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what it was like. He was just, uh, he was driven, and um, we all wanted to work for him and do well for him. But did you feel that way while you were working for him, or did it take some after retrospective thinking that, it, you know what, that was great? Oh, I knew it was great working for him. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it was hard. I mean, I left in tears, at, not because I was leaving, but because it was just so hard at that point. Right. That's when I vowed that uh, if I was ever going to work like that again, it would be for myself. Hmm. Yeah. And... Uh, it seems like it gave you vision onto how you would want to run your own kitchen and 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 have have your support staff. Uh, yeah, support you. yeah, we were never going to go to the levels that Charlie did. That's for sure. Yeah, um, but yeah, absolutely. It um, creatively, I think it was the best thing for me. Uh, it, it helped so much. Uh, he wasn't doing anything that anybody else did. It was all him. It was all coming out of his mind like give us an example of like what you yeah what was it a di- what was a dish or something that you guys did that just blew your mind that you thought man i i don't think anybody else could conceive of this he did a lot of healthier style of cooking so he wouldn't use starches or anything like that he would take maybe some carrot juice and he'd reduce down the carrot juice and infuse it with vanilla and cardamom and serve it with um scallops and blood sausage that sort of thing right I, I love that That's personally awesome. yeah. because I, I mean, I almost I think about that a lot of times like, OK, well, this dish tastes amazing. Right. But you just used a ton of fat. There's a ton of starch and fried. And like, you know, I make the argument like I could fry shit and, it would, you know, t- arguably taste good if you put enough butter and salt on it, you know. But yeah. so like that type of technique, I love to hear that because I think that's something really outside the box. Yeah. And he was sourcing ingredients from all over the planet. And it was very important for him to use the local ingredients as well and bring in farmers into the restaurant. and um, Which there wasn't such an emphasis on back then. You're right. There wasn't. It, it seemed to me that he was really starting that um, what became a trend, I guess, but he, he was... You can say it, farm to fork, farm to table, whatever you yeah. can say. That, yeah, he was like trend. the original farm to table sort of guy. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so you left in tears, but was that because you knew where you were going, and where were you going after that? I left because it was just, it got to be too hard. It was just, um, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh, I knew... Well, actually, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I was thinking about doing my own thing, but um, as cooks, you we get good at cooking the food, but we're not great with the money. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> right. the money part still was uh, challenging to me. So um, I did want to have one more um, mentor. So um, I went to the inn at Little Washington, and um, I started working with Patrick O'Connell. Right. And... Um, that's where I met my wife and then she became the money part for me. She, Good move. she, right. She knew all about that. And she was one that said, wait a minute, Shane, you've done all these things and you're still a cook. What's going on here? You know, let's, let's take the next step. They're good that way, right? Yeah. They definitely can push you. <laughs> what? I, you know, the, the in at little Washington is, it gets praise. It's, it's also a four star, uh, Four Diamond Forbes property. It's correct? probably the most decorated restaurant in in America for sure, and probably the world too. Um, right now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's a uh, the head of Relay and Chateau North America. Wow. And we never. That's, I feel like we never talk about that. Like no. it, it's somewhere just in the back of our mind, but we we need to get out there and 
explore. Yeah, go have a snack. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's a great place to go. That if you haven't been there, that is an amazing place. The, the town is like stepping back into time, and every blade of grass is kept like such, and it's an amazing place. And isn't the town actually just called Washington, North Carolina? It's a little Washington. It is little Washington. Okay, I had this. I had this discussion with Felicia, your wife, about. Yeah, she's like, oh no, it's just called Washington. I was like, I think they call it Little Washington. So, so see, Felicia, cleared that uh, up. I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so that was uh, potentially that was your last step when you finally had your mentor's guidance, and yeah. and then you said, okay, I'm so going to do this. Elizabeth and I went on a food and wine tour of Europe. We got the Eurorail pass and stayed at some one star hotels and ate at three star restaurants. Yeah, right. That sounds right. Yeah, uh, it was great. And uh, we came back, and sh- I wanted to go back to Seattle. I had spent some time there, and she didn't want to go to Seattle. It, she wanted to go to Austin, and I didn't want to go to Austin. So the next best choice was here, right right in uh, North Carolina and uh, the mid-Atlantic states, North Carolina. And they were the ones that were supposed to be doing very well. And they certainly did and yeah. continue to do do so. So That um, must have been a crazy time in because you opened up in Durham. I mean, just thinking about it, it's really the tail end of the tobacco farming. Um, yeah. You know, like you were saying, I mean, we're just starting to figure out at that time where, like, the phrase farm to table is maybe starting to get rumored about. And uh, it, it's making a move. Like, North Carolina, that's the thing. I mean, I wasn't here at that time. Max, you weren't even here yet. Right. Uh, you think about it. And, and North Carolina has never, especially Durham, really supported the chain restaurants, like the big national chains. And so I can only think about it. And I know, obviously, Magnolia Grill and Nana's were around at that time. So, had you eaten in those places and said, oh, I, I could do something like that? Yeah. I remember we actually went to Magnolia Grill and talked to Ben and said, hey, what do you think about a, another restaurant in town? Do you think they'll support it? And he was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. These, this is – and I found out to be true, too, that Durham has the best diners anywhere. They're, mm. They are Loyal. fantastic. You know, or, or I should say they're the They're sophisticated, too. Like Very much so. They're not – they want – unique they want progressive they want they want something different which is cool that's what we gave them at foursquare yeah and um that's one of the reasons why we were so successful yeah so let's let's figure that out let's let's talk about foursquare well actually before we get into talking about your opening of your restaurant we should probably talk about the folks that help uh, keep the lights on over at our place yeah, and so when you're opening up a restaurant, if you ever do again, or maybe even at the Durham Hotel, you might want to call the people at Spot On because Spot On provides mobile payment technology and management system for restaurants and small businesses. They're really great. They help to streamline everything in your business, whether uh, you need your inventory system to speak with your POS system or your payroll system to speak with your POS system. All these things, they can help you coordinate, streamline, all from an app on your phone so you can get some ho- time at home with your with your kids or your wife or your spouse or whoever you want to spend time with. Uh, and it's very easy. There's a local rep. Her name is Tanya Manibo. You just give her a call on her personal cell phone number, which is 858-213-7820. That's 858-213-7820. Or if you're in front of your computer right now, just email her, Tanya M at spoton.com. That's T-A-N-Y-A-M at spoton.com. And change the way that you find staff by getting GigPro on your cell phone. That's right. GigPro is an app that helps you find a job in the industry. If you're a pro, like a bartender, a chef, a line cook, dishwasher, whatever you do in the industry, this is a way to find a gig for the day, for the week, temporary, temporary to permanent. Check out GigPro. They've 86 all the unnecessary BS in hiring and hospitality. You'd never have to look at another resume again. You just check it out. Go to gigpro.com backslash NCFB to get your first gig for free. You guys were a little bit tired when you came in this morning, uh, and you said, you know what? We need a little coffee to perk us up. <laughs> so what right. do we do? We decided to, uh, oh, we, we didn't do any of this, Matt. Elizabeth did all of it. We, as the NCF and B team. Did. Yes, we put together a Chemex of deliciously fine ground Joe Van Gogh coffee, specifically the organic food for farmers blend, which, oh, that flavor profile, a little milk chocolate, a little lemon zest, mm. perhaps some cane sugar in the finish. You don't really need to do anything to that coffee. You know, it's like you have a cup of coffee and then you put cream and you put sugar in there and you're like, oh, I love coffee. It's like, no, no, no. 
You, you like cream and sugar, <laughs> and you're just using coffee yeah. as the vessel to which you drink this. This is coffee. You have it the way uh, it's intended. It's a medium roast. And this particular coffee has been partnered with Food for Farmers, a nonprofit that addresses food security in the commu- in coffee communities to bring you a new cause, which helps create a positive impact for the farmers and their families. To learn a little bit more information, go to jovango.com or click the link in our show notes. Yeah. Let's talk about Foursquare. So that... This is this was your coming out party to the industry of opening up your own restaurant and opening up your own space. So for one, where was food? Where was Foursquare? It was in Durham. It was on Chapel Hill Road. Um, those who know Durham pretty well, it was right across the street from the cow store. You know those old convenience stores with the life size cow on top of it. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. yeah, uh, yeah. We were right there, down the street from what uh, Durham Co-op. Yes, that's yeah, right. Yep. right on. Nice. And so, yeah, let us understand kind of what was the what was the vibe? Like how big was it? What it was fine dining, correct? Yeah, Elizabeth said that she didn't want to start her own restaurant unless we had a freestanding building with its own parking, you know. It's like, "Oh, in Durham, good luck finding that." Right? Yeah. But she was able to find this old Victorian home that had been a restaurant uh, probably for 20 years before we got our hands on it. And um yeah, we, we found the building. It was an old Victorian. had 100 seats. had the wraparound porch, which is the four-square style of Victorian. And uh, so we were able to do about 120 when the weather was nice. Hmm. Wow. That's a, that's a good-sized restaurant for a fine dining. Especially, yeah. Yeah, you, we wanted to have that many seats so that we could make enough money to support ourselves. That's what I was going to say. You need, the, you need enough to, to push through. Yeah, otherwise you're just banging your head against the wall for nothing. And how were you received uh, to the community when you opened up? It was slow in the beginning. Is that um, right? Yeah, because uh, we did it on a shoelace, so to speak, and um, um, we didn't do any advertising. So uh, it wasn't until Greg Cox wrote his first uh, review of us that uh, sent us on our way. Yeah, Greg Cox, the former uh, restaurant critic for the News and Observer in the area, which was, yeah, and four stars you got, which was the most uh, star- maximum stars you could get. And uh, I believe you, and then that puts you into that lofty uh, air of Magnolia Grill and Nana's at the time. Yeah, we, um, what I wanted to do when I started it was to be a, a neighborhood restaurant, a place where first and foremost where the the neighbors could come by and but we put the white tablecloths down and i think that changed the perception t- for us to be like a destination restaurant so yeah um i think that's a little bit how how we became destination you probably kept the linen uh companies in business yeah they're expensive too <laughs> <laughs> seriously that's that's where all the profit goes yeah in the linens, dining, yeah is that um so okay and so at some point you just Again, I mean, it, I think it had been 15 years, but from opening to when you're when you just said this is this is done, or maybe it was because oh, this those guys are starting the North Carolina Food and Beverage podcast, so I'm going to get out of this business because I don't want to listen to those two buffoons anymore. <laughs> yeah, or, you guys or Matt Weiss shut, is moving to the area. Yeah, we don't you shut down the year that we opened him. up. So, is that right? Yeah, yeah. We, we started in 2016, so yeah. I believe that was when you ultimately had uh, had stepped away. Any particular thoughts as to? Why did the end come? Yeah, I could give you two good reasons. Yeah. Uh, one rings true even more so today is that it's hard, hard to find uh, help. Yeah. And um, that combined with uh, it was a hundred and what about twenty year, hundred twenty year old building at that point, and it was getting the best of me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And that, and I was tired. You know, I was the, the kind of tired that you get from. Um, a lifetime of work and not, not so much, you know, a week off or two weeks off wasn't going to cut it. I had to take some serious time off. Yeah, the, the amount of hours that you put on your knees as a chef in your position is like triple what anyone else would do in any other walk of life, even if you're like in construction or whatever. It's like, yeah, you're out there, you're working, you're working hard, 40, maybe even 50 hours. But that's not what we're talking about when you're in restaurants. You're talking about like 70 Sometimes they're 80 hours, like double what someone else is going to do. Yeah, I could work like 29 out of 30 days in a month, too, and that that is just too too hard. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that uh, now, if you had could go back in the DeLorean and the Space Machine, you would have set it up differently? Oh, I don't know. I, yeah. It was great. Foursquare was great. It was a wonderful place. It was a wonderful restaurant. Uh, 
look back on all of the years as uh, I loved it. It was great fun. Yeah, but I, mean, I guess I mean, you know, so 15 years, that's a really good run. I mean, that's a good run for, yeah. and uh, I'm assuming it was financially successful. Yeah, uh, we to, could to have kept extent. it going if we wanted to. Okay. Uh, but I mean, for like the personal, the balance, the, the you know, all that we need, we have come to know and understand about the uh, happiness and the, 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 the the healthiness of your staff like you know if you and your wife had maybe gotten to take more vacations maybe gone back to europe and you shut down the restaurant like people do or do you think you would have changed any of those things yeah and you put it that way then yeah perhaps i'm uh closing the restaurant for maybe a month or even two months out of a year right would have probably been a good idea yeah i don't think of those things but the, no know, i don't think anybody did it you know it's funny um probably a contemporary of yours as well remember max when we went up to new york city and uh one of my favorite restaurants in new york city is born oh. out of north carolina the yeah. simone uh chip and tina who had their restaurant in chapel hill the name's yeah. escaping me right now Blue. i just somebody we just had this discussion with Actually, the other Shea day might be able to help us with that uh it was, it was named after his blue eyes remember it was called uh and, and and Carolina Blue, it was like the blue... I'm sorry. The blue something. Know. Anyhow, but yeah, they, they ran a restaurant and just the sweetest people ever. And she was a yeah. former Rockette. And, That's right. Uh, but they, you know, even in New York City, and which always which always made me like think twice at the time, but now it makes so much, se- so much sense. They closed for a couple of weeks, two to four weeks in the summer and, and go travel and just yeah. shut it down. Because otherwise, like you, I'm sure they were on all the time. And and those chef run restaurants don't really run without the chef. Yeah. Like, as much as you want to admit that you know your your sous chef could could run it or your chef de cuisine, it, and maybe like nowadays with like certain restaurants, you know, like you have to have a little bit of freedom. You have to have like trust, and you have to like know that the next person can be you know your you know can interpret what you're doing. Uh, you know, then then you can do it. What is it? Bone soiree. Oh, that's right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They had a place on the coast in the Outer Banks that was called Blue Something. Remember that's they, right. That they was a, the original, and then they and moved, then they to, moved to Bon Soiree. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, Bon Soiree. Um, that was another like fantastic, iconic spot at the time. But yeah, you, you, it's like, I mean, in a way, the restaurant is you. Like it's it's about you. And if you're not there, I I worked for Wolfgang Puck for a really long time. If Wolfgang wasn't in the kitchen at Spago. Then you're like, well, why are we here? Like, we came because we want him to cook the food, and he's not cooking every every section anyhow. But it gives you the illusion that, okay, maybe he touched a part of this dish, and then it gives you that kind of feeling. And I'm sure Emeril got that when you worked with him. It's like you want to pretend like he's there at all times. A sense of security. It gives people a sense of security when they see you in the dining room. They like to see that. And Charlie used to sue to say. If you're in the dining room having dinner and I'm not in the building, then your dinner is free. Huh. Oh, jeez. But how can that's you do crazy that in that for him? You know, in this day and age, yeah. like, especially a guy like Emerald or Wolfgang, like that just becomes impossible. Yeah, and these guys have multiple restaurants, and right. to do it, like I, I don't know how they did it. You know, I tried it and I found it to be extremely difficult. Right, because at, at, there was a point where you had three at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, I have so much respect for the guys that do it and make it work because it is very hard. So what's your take on that? I mean, having three at the same time, because I, I had never had the chance to eat in because I'd come almost, I think, after all of them had closed or changed hands. But uh, did you feel like, oh, if you weren't there that you would get feedback or like something was suffering? Or do you think, that, on the contrary, that you had set up systems that you that everything was running the way you wanted it to? Yeah, I had to go to my partners and say, um, it wasn't working for me. I, I can't do this. I have to go back to Foursquare and I have to uh, take care of that. And mm. um, the the three restaurant things, it, it was too hard. You know, Foursquare was almost on that point. But then to add more on top of it, you know, you're always looking for additional revenue streams and all of that. Sure. But, but um, yeah, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to modern yeah, day. I, I do want to hear about what you were doing between that time. But now you're kind of, you've learned all those lessons. Uh, and uh, we haven't had a chance to talk to Kelsey over here. But uh, but you came into the Durham. And from what I understand, Kelsey, and you can answer this. You guys, uh, Andrea Rusing, uh, former guest of the show and uh, of the very famous Max interview story. That's probably her 
most notorious moment. Don't ask. Y- you guys, uh, after that, were left uh, rudderless a little bit with, with nobody at the helm, but you kind of pieced it together and had figured out a system. Yeah, so um, we, uh, right around the time the pandemic hit, um, Andrea had left and a lot of her team had left. Um, and we were left without a, an executive chef, so we started brainstorming ideas as to how we're going to run this restaurant together. So we decided to have a collaborative sort of kitchen um, where all of us sort of comes up with ideas together and we taste everything that we want to make. And like we had all this freedom to make all these really amazing things, so we just decided this is how we're going to run it. There were like four or five of us in the kitchen at the time. So um, we were like, this is, this is going to be fun. Yeah. Like, let's really let's get in, in this. Yeah, let's lean into was this. Was it fun? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, it was harder than I think we all thought it was going to be. But it was super fun, and we all got along very well. But we didn't have a direction. It was almost like we had too many ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, Too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks in the kitchen, (laughs) yeah. So um, when Shane came along, he sort of took that idea and ran with it, but gave us a lot more structure, I would say. Um, But we're still very much a collaborative kitchen. You know, Um, our sous chef will come to me and ask for tons of things and we'll, we'll like brainstorm ideas like about desserts that he thinks are cool or I think, you know, this would really go well with this dish that you're making. Um, And then we sort of go from there. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been at the Durham? Um, Almost three years. Okay, so yeah, so you've been there for, I mean, the Durham opened in Actually, when did it open? It opened, it opened in, like right uh, 2016, I believe. Yeah, it's been, it's been like six years. We yeah. went to we went to one of the opening nights, or friends and family, I believe. When uh, no, 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 you went to it, and I crashed oh, and the yeah. You and party. Fisher crashed. That's right. Matt and his family decided to have dinner. They didn't invite us or anything. They were just there, and then we walked in, and lo and behold, I was probably texting Matt like, "Hey, what are you doing?" He's like, "Oh, I'm uh, I'm busy right now. Uh, sorry, I can't answer." <laughs> no, and then I oh, see oh, no. him with his family, and we're like, "Oh, look who it is." Is. And so then we just sat down at the table and invited ourselves. And then we were like, yeah, can I get the chicken dish? And we just like started ordering things. Can I get some of his wine? Yeah. I'm like, hey, let me get to this. And then we left. And then left Matt with a tab. But uh, that's not how it went. But that's how I like to remember it. But um, so I got to connect these dots then. So Chef Shane, you had been... You had been running kitchens as the main person this whole time. Now you're walking into a to a team and a team that like for all intents and purposes was getting the job done without you. And now you could be maybe not the one that was like, you didn't have to put the LeBron James, like put the whole team on your back type of mentality. And having been that you had been out of the business for a little bit, maybe this was a welcome change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's much easier doing the Durham than it was doing any of the other jobs. Yeah. For me, uh, there's a, there's a lot more structure there. That and maybe it was after Andrea left and you guys all did your collaboration that it really made you guys bond together. They, they, exactly the people right. at the Durham work so well together that um, it was somebody spent a lot of time uh, creating the atmosphere that there is there now. And we all love each other. It's yeah. like a big family, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. And I have to imagine you, Kelsey, that you'd probably. Whether you knew about Chef Ingram before he got there, eventually you knew who he was or what what he had done and what he had brought to the table in the community. So what was that like to just start working with this guy? Um, I was very nervous, um, really, really nervous to work with him. But he's so nice and very chill, and he's got a lot of really good ideas. So um, it's been been great. (laughs) Yeah, Chef, like I've never met you before. And when you know about a chef, especially one that has a, a resume such as yourself, you just assume, like, this guy's going to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's going to be rough, you know, or just, you know, hard-nosed, whatever. You're an affable, easy-to-get-along-with guy, at least in this room, well, the this moment. The hard-nosed people, uh, <laughs> that's gone. The, the, the Food Network, I think, uh, changed the way the perception of uh, cooks and chefs in America – the yellers and the screamers and the people who have something to hide are 
or either left or or on their way out. And I think that um, it's a it's a new world in in culinary now. And thank goodness for that. Yeah, yeah. and and just take that one step further because at the Durham, you know, it's a hotel, it's a boutique hotel, but you have. A lot of sir, right? You have you have breakfast service, coffee service. Mm-hmm. We have and roof lunch, service, roof service, lunch, lunch service, breakfast, yeah. brunch, dinner. Yeah. So how <laughs> does the, I mean how does that work? And it's seven days a week, right? It where, is where the restaurants open and everything. So how does how do people get vacation and wellness time, etc.? Oh, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. You just everybody buckles down when uh, you know somebody needs a vacation or time off or whatever. And um, like Kelsey said, it's it's family out there. So. Um, we all take care of each other. And w- and going back to that idea of the collaborative kitchen, yeah, I mean, you walk in, I, and I'm assuming, I guess you were told of what was going on, but uh, you must have had some ideas about like, oh, oh, this can't be working, or or were you of the mind that, well, I'm going to come come in and change it, or what was your I gotta go in mindset? there and crack skulls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no. These kids don't have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> I talked to John, and John hired me. And uh, I John, told him, who's the GM, John Her- John Her- Herbert, yes, and uh, fellow Mets fan, shout right. out to John, right? Um, and I told him what I was looking for. I told him, you know, what I could do and what I couldn't do, and um, it was one of the best conversations I ever had with somebody in the business. And um, we agreed that bringing me on might be good for the hotel and good for me as well. That's cool. So. Uh, Chef Kelsey, I want to get back to you. Kelsey Legault. That's right. Creole? It's Cajun. Cajun. I'm sorry, Cajun. Mm -hmm. So does that have anything to do with your upbringing or culinary style that you're of Cajun descent? Not not really. Um, My dad, is his side of the family was Cajun, so we did grow up eating gumbo and doing crawfish boils and um, etouffee and all of that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. um, which is my favorite kind of food. It is delicious. I, my dad was a huge Emerald fan, so um, uh, I have my like great-great-grandmother's gumbo recipe that I still use, um, which is just delicious. <laughs> um, but it doesn't really have... I don't... I like to cook from all different kinds of... Um, Background, background, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think it really affects me all that much. I've never been to New Orleans. Um, you need to go. I know it's on my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> so, but let's talk about your side of it. So, you're you're handling the sweeter side of the menu. You're mm-hmm. doing pastry and and desserts. Um, where does where did you kind of come from, and how did what's your background in getting up to this point? Um, well, my family is big on cooking. So my mom, I used to cook with her. Um, she's big on sweets, so she has the best chocolate chip cookie recipe. Um, she makes an amazing chocolate chess pie. All of the like American classics, um, she's really good at. So I always knew growing up that I didn't want to have an office job. I wanted to be in the food industry, um, but my parents forced me to go to college, so I um, majored in nutrition, which was the closest that I could get to to um, desserts mm-hmm. and food. And I always sort of knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, and then once I graduated, um, I decided that was 100% what I was going to do. So I went back to school and got my degree in baking and pastry arts. And then I just like to pull from everyone, like all of the people that I've worked with and Um, make a bunch of different things and try different things. Um, You know, I love a good bread pudding. Mm. (laughs) It's delicious. By the way, uh, my daughter Charlotte, who's nine years old, she wanted to make cookies last night, and I saw genius out of her. And I know I'm her dad and all this, like, okay, whatever. She looked at a menu, or sorry, looked at a recipe on her iPad, and she found, and she's like, she wanted to make sugar cookies. She looked at it, and she's like, this is complex, but really, I just want I want the simple things from this sugar cookie. This is what she said to me. I was mm-hmm. uh, we just came back. My older daughter and I went to the mall to get her dress for her dance this weekend. And when we come back in, we see Charlotte's in the kitchen. You She's took taking, Alexandra for the dress. I did. I dude, I'm great at the the fashion side of things and shopping. I love it. Says you. So no, she loved it. She's like, I'm so glad that you brought me, Dad. You have the patience to do this. This is another Felicia dig, too, in one episode. (laughs) But Charlotte looks at this recipe, and she's like, this is really complex. I think I just want to use 
three ingredients. I want flour, sugar, and butter. She's like, it seems like that just makes sense. And so I did that. And I go, oh, okay, yeah. And so she had the the dough that she, and then she had been like kind of working it with her hands. And then Santa bought this thing at uh, Christmas time. It was like one of those little like cookie presses. The cookie press. Yeah, where you can just kind of click it mm-hmm. and, and it out comes out like a nice little shape. And so I gave that to her. I'm like, maybe try this. She's like, cool. So then she got it and boom, 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 started pressing out all these cookies and made maybe like, I don't know, five dozen cookies and put, threw them in the oven. And even that, she's like, this is 14 to 16. I'm going to go 14 because then let's just predict to see where it's at from that point on. And she did. And we pulled them out. We let them rest. They were the best cookies I've had in I don't know how long. <laughs> they were so simple. You're going to have to have her talk to Kelsey in about 10 years. I was just about to say, <laughs> we're hiring. <laughs> Seriously. And, and I mean, like, I, I mean, we all looked at each other. Like, my wife, my older daughter, and I were like, this is, like, really good. So mm-hmm. there was something so brilliant. And this is the same daughter that won't eat meat or tomato sauce or, like, really, like, anything. She likes bread, cheese. Uh, it's about it. Cream cheese. Maybe. Shrimpy nuggets. Shrimpy nugs. Yeah, she'll do that. So it was just cool to see, like, she's like... Mm, I like the fact that she looked at a recipe and then was like, mm, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I'm going to use this as a guideline, but I'm going to do it this way. Now, it could have gone wildly wrong, but it didn't. And I was like, well, oh, maybe the maybe there's something there going on here, Charlotte. Well, there's something very cool about the, like... Um very intense desserts that you see like at Alenia, you know, the cotton candy balloon yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Like that's an experience. That's very cool. Um, but getting back to the basics is what I think is the most delicious because you can make a chocolate chip cookie and you can make it, you know, the best chocolate chip cookie on the planet just because it is what your mom used to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think there is something so good about just the basics. Simple, but delicious. Yeah. It's Quality perfect. ingredients. Do you also make the pastries for the coffee shop? Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, and so what do you put out for there? Um, we do a lot of muffins, and okay. um, we're working on croissants, and we do focaccia and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I have a, a small team that helps me do all of the bread production because we also make the burger buns, the hoagie buns, the hot dog buns, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but we're also doing a lot of gluten-free and vegan stuff, oh. um, which is exciting. We're trying to get really good at that because there's such a market there. Yep. Um, and there are a lot of food allergies and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, that's like a kind of a fun challenge. I would it think. is very fun, a lot more fun than I thought and difficult, but really, really interesting, um, mm-hmm. You know, using coconut oil as your butter, or um, we just got some really great vegan butter, which is very fun to use. Yeah. Um, so, do you, do you mix the nut flours for your gluten free? Mm-hmm. So, well, we have a bunch of different options. So, we have like oat flour, pistachio. Um, we have a gluten free flour from Anson Mills that we use. Um, a bunch of we have like six different options and we're just doing a bunch of experiments we had a jp of jp's pastry uh who makes you know is known for making gluten-free and vegan uh, and vegan uh pastry and that was his whole jam was he's like it's about the blend it's it's not mm-hmm. about using one flour it's about using multiple flours and that gets you to that gluten-free area which sounds so counterintuitive when you hear it but then he's he got deep into understanding how that worked and it went over my head but yeah i was like oh okay well you uh, gotta mix the flowers mm-hmm. yeah it's a lot of science i love science so it's very very fun for me <laughs> yeah no this is fantastic so okay so um i do want to give you guys a little plug because this i believe you're having a dinner mm. that's going to celebrate somebody that we all know and probably charlotte would love uh which is uh talking about prodigal farms out of uh roguemont north carolina you guys on april 13th are celebrating the upcoming upcoming retirement of Catherine spawn and david crabble the award-winning cheesemakers and goat wranglers of <laughs> prodigal farms so you're doing this on the rooftop uh, explain to us what what's the idea of this? How what's this dinner going to be like? Well, Kat and I have we've been using her cheeses for years, and I we were trying to remember. I think it was at the farmers market where I first met her, and her stuff was always unique and and delicious. And she's such a, a wonderful person too. Yeah, and um, she has sold her farm now, so she's uh, ending her 
her um, her goat cheese career, I guess you could call it. Yeah. And we thought a send off would be nice. Um, I, we asked if she wanted to do some sort of event with us so we could have the community come by and thank her for all of her years of hard work and. Um, we decided that maybe we'll do it on the roof. And she said, oh, maybe I can bring some of the kids up, some of the baby goats. So we call it Goats on the Roof, and <laughs> it's a send-off for Kat and Dave and their wonderful uh, contribution to the industry. So there will be actual live goats on the roof of the Durham Hotel. Yeah, that's right, unless something happens. What and... could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what everybody says, but they'll be in a pen, right? They do yeah. jump, you know, so... <laughs> no, Okay. Yeah. She knows what she's doing. Let's put I'm some sure. Parachutes on those guys. <laughs> <laughs> what's the What's the menu going to look like? Um, we're going to put a grill up there. Okay. And uh, we'll do some vegetables and some meats on the grill. We're going to do some hors d'oeuvres with some of their cheeses, and Kelsey's going to make some desserts with the cheeses as mm -hmm. well. Some mm. bite-sized things, yeah. multiple options. Maybe some Gruyere for something like that. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> um, well, tickets are $60 per person and include one drink and all the food. It's a cash bar that's also available. You can purchase tickets by calling 919-768-8831 or click the link in our show notes. Durham dot com backslash events deck a lot of backslashes you just click the link in our show notes and we'll we'll get them there that sounds super fun yeah that sounds awesome i need i need an excuse to go back to the durham hotel actually i don't need an excuse but that's a great excuse to get there be on the rooftop that when you see that sun setting in the west felicia and i've had very romantic times up there but it really just made us like go oh the west coast California, where we're from. And it's like, you don't get that West Coast sunset too, too often. Elizabeth knows what I'm talking about. That, like, it's so nice to just see that sunset right there and, and actually watch the sunset behind the mountains or the skyline. So, yeah, get up there to the Durham Hotel. It's beautiful. It is, yeah. yeah it's, it's very wonderful. Mad Men looking when you're in the Durham Hotel. It's very, like, mid century, 60s, cool. Like, do you guys, like, uh, you have to dress that way, too? Do you guys wear, like, a three-piece suit and, like, you get your hair up and, like, bobby pins and all? Yeah, you can. <laughs> I mean, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's the Peggy and the Don Draper of the kitchen over here that, that, that we have going on. <laughs> Wasn't there, before we get out of here, uh, there was a time, you know, mid-pandemic where... Uh, you guys were running food. You were only serving food on the roof, right? And yep. so you were running up food through the elevator or something like that? Yep, that's exactly right, um, which was hard, really hard. We had to do some um, some rejiggering of things because, you know, you can't serve a, a cookie skillet with ice cream and send it up to the roof because then the ice cream will melt by the time you get to your yeah. roof. And there's only one elevator. So. One, yeah, there's one service elevator and one regular elevator, so... Yeah, it was hard. Fun. <laughs> it's kind of nice that we're where, pretty where's close. Where's my fillet? Yeah. It's, on, it's on floor three. There's a little problem with the uh, with the elevator. It's stuck yeah. up three. And we're going to all knock on some wood right now to make sure that uh, we are out of the pandemic. Every time we think it, yeah. something happens. But I think for now, we're, we're good to go. We're good. For now, at least. Yeah. But, uh, well, we'll before we get out of here, for one, I know that you guys have your event, and we also have our event that's going to be coming up. And who knows? We might have to pressure you to be a part of this. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, like, ooh, we, we also, we don't have any, well, no, uh, hold on. <laughs> I was going to say we didn't have anyone doing desserts at, at Bubbles and Brisket, but we do because Bestow Baked Goods is, is providing all of the yes. fantastic desserts that are there. But one is great, two is even better. I don't know. Chef Legault, you might have to do some <laughs> sort of... Uh, a brisket dessert. A brisket <laughs> dessert, something. But uh, but Chef Ingram, who knows? We're talking about bubbles and brisket because we're pairing fantastic smoked brisket, or it doesn't have to be smoked. It's however you want to cook However you want to prepare it. Brisket uh, matched and paired with our favorite thing, bubbles. Yeah. I mean, champagne is ideal. And going back to your fancy, fancy Foursquare and Trotter days and all that, you know your way around some champagne. Yeah, two of my favorite things. So uh, you won't have to twist my arm too hard. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe uh, verbal commitment, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so he's in. No, uh, so, But on June 4th, we're doing Bubbles and Brisket at Smoky Hollow. That is in downtown Raleigh in the new spot, uh, just kind of right next to uh, Glenwood South, pretty close. Yeah. And we do have uh, in writing commitments from Lawrence Barbecue, Jake Wood, uh, Matthew Register, Matthew, Southern Smoke. Yeah. 
Carrie Schleifer, uh, your neighbor at Alley 26. Uh, Longleaf Swine. Longleaf Swine. Hank's Downtown Dive is going to be doing a brisket taco. Got uh, Nick Damp of Damp Good Barbecue. Uh, we, we, I mean, there's there are more. Oh, James Sampson of the Corner Boys. Yeah. There's so many. Brandon Shepard out there on the uh, out there in the uh, Emerald Isle. Emerald Isle. Yeah. I mean, literally, the list keeps going on and on and on. And more people are asking if they can join in. We're gonna have to like figure out if we have enough space in here. But it's gonna be yeah. a wild party, folks. And it's gonna be, you know, we don't. Uh, it's you. You get your ticket and you're in, and you get. The whole bar of at least, I think last year we had 18. This year it's going to be a minimum of 20, maybe more champagne. And then there's going to be a bunch of beer from Crafton, uh, Crafton Beer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot going on. Yeah, a little uh, live entertainment of some sort, uh, but uh, details to come soon. Check out all of our social media. You can get tickets at ncfbpodcast.com. And uh, we'd love to see you there. And yeah. before we get out of here, we, and for the two of you, because... Well, for especially for you, Kelsey, we're talking about uh, sweets. We're talking about proof alcohol ice cream. Ooh. I don't know if you've figured out the science uh, because you love science, mm -hmm. but trying to freeze alcohol into a dairy and sugar filled sugar filled uh, concoction isn't always the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. But the folks out there at Proof Alcohol Ice Cream have figured out how to put seven percent ABV in every pint of ice cream, and you have flavors such as coconut rum or strawberry moonshine or bourbon caramel. But uh, delicious. We'll send you home with a pint here, and uh, you can find them at any uh, any place that sells them such as Harris Teeter or Lowe's Markets or our favorite place for you to find them would be a Triangle Wine Company. That's right. So Triangle Wine Company will actually be providing all of that bubbles for bubbles and brisket. So they have a great selection of champagne and Prosecco and Cava, but also a great selection of beer and vermouth and cocktail mixers. They have tap rooms at all of their locations, whether you're in Holly Springs, Southern Pines, you're out there in North Raleigh, in the Bedford community, or you're at their flagship store in Cary at uh, Waverly Place. So go to Triangle Wine Company, go to trianglewineco.com, use the NCFB promo code and uh, for a very nice discount. But for now... Uh, go check out the Durham Hotel. Go 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 to the rooftop bar. Check out the sunset and uh, have a pastry and a, and a meal and maybe some drinks. And uh, you will eat and drink very merrily. Thanks for listening to the NC F and B podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember five stars are encouraged.